Sometimes the Royal Navy really takes buccaneering to a whole new level. And the Bodicea class are a good example of this. We have the Pathfinder class, built by Camel Eds. We have the Forward class, built by, Govan, uh, uh, by Fairfield Shipbuilding Engineering Company in Govan, where the Type 26s are currently being built on that site. We have the Adventure class, built by Armstrong Whitworth at Ellswick. And we have the Sentinels, built by Vickers and Baron Furness. The Royal Navy had gone out, the Admiralty had gone out and gone to all these shipyards and gone, we need this new type of cruiser. It's going to be a scout cruiser. We're going to give you all specifications. Whoever builds the best one is going to get a huge order, but we will only buy two up front from each of you. They did. They were all laid down in 1903-1904, and they were all completed in service by 1905. Nineteen oh six, they uh, yard sent. Um, so, uh, are you going to be ordering new ones? Who's won? We're still evaluating. In 1907, they lay down the Bodicea class. They lay down the Bodicea class at Her Majesty's Royal Dockyard, Pembroke. <coughs> the Royal Navy had uh, evaluated, taken on board all the lessons of all these different companies' designs. The flower of British engineering, the absolute best companies you can get. And took that knowledge, took that information, and went to town with it and made their own class. <laughs> I mean, it would be like Cutie World example, if the US Navy when running the LCS program had still had one of the uh, had a yard which they could build stuff in themselves without needing a private company. And had basically gone Yeah, Lockheed Martin, we'll take uh three of your design. And we'll take three of the free uh, three of these uh three uh, of your design. And maybe free from someone else. And had evaluated them and then started building their own design. Now, you might be sitting here going, actually, Alex, that sounds pretty darn cool. That sounds pretty darn sensible. I'm not only out of Iron Brew, I'm out of Kinder Buno. The world is now going to face my wrath for sarcasm. Anyway. But the trouble is, we can't do that, you say. We don't have the yard space. We used to be able to build in Portsmouth. Don't have the yard space anymore. Sort it off. Plymouth. It's not the yard space anymore. And Pembroke Dockyard no longer exists. It's a bunch of decaying buildings and a memory. It's sad. But it's no longer that. So, Canada trip. Well, this week is going to be interesting because you're going to get some of the videos which are coming out prior to the Canada trip. I think on Friday, instead of a UAD video, you've got scheduled the reading list for the Canada trip, which I hope you're going to enjoy. Uh, basically, some of the books which I think you should be, which I think you'd find useful to read, 
Wildwood uh, to see what's it doing on the Canada trip, but also some books to read for while I'm, you know, the various videos that have been coming up while I'm away. Because I do realise I'm, I'm going to have to keep my audience happy if I don't manage to do the lives. I, I'm hoping to do some lives, but if I don't, I, I don't want you all to be unhappy and, you know, going away from me. So there are all some more videos coming out. Because, frankly, I have to be nice to you all. And want to be nice to you all. But I have to be nice to you all. And I say I have to be nice to you all. Because my mum has told me I have to be nice to you all. Actual conversation had this morning. You wouldn't be going to Canada without your subscribers. No, I wouldn't. I, I have told them this. It's very kind of them. You better be nice to them and say thank you. Yes, mum. I will do. Make sure you do. So, thank you. Never let it be said that I do not do what my mother tells me to when she's looking very scary. Rest of the time, meh. When she's looking scary, yes, ma'am. So, this is the trip we've got roughly scheduled up. And it's going to be fun. Hopefully some public lectures take place. Hopefully some book signings and other things take get thrown into it as we go along. Um, I've messaged everyone. Everyone seems to be keen, but no details have been fully confirmed for all those things yet. And I'm hoping they'll be confirmed before I go away, but it's getting very close now. So they might not happen. Which I find upsetting, but that'll be like, that's life. Life happens. And you live with it. And yeah, I, I suppose giving people four months' notice was probably a little bit too short. To quote actually one person who responded to that. I was apparently supposed to tell them two years in advance I was coming. I was sort of going, mm, I didn't have the money two years in advance, let alone the knowledge I'd actually make it. Anyway. Here is Bodicea, pictured in 1914 whilst visiting Russia with the first battle cruiser squadron. Now, at which point someone's going to pop up and go, that's not how you spell battle cruiser, and not in the battle cruiser squadron. And I will have a debate with you because it depends on when they're talking about newspapers and the thing where it starts, starts, starts <laughs> writing. But in this period, I'm going to go with battle cruiser as two words. Bodicea at this point is pretty much a new ship. She's only been completed in 1909. Now, actually, I have to admit, she is in the ship I would have personally captaining my battle cruiser squadron. And there is a reason for that. Her top speed is 25 knots. Yeah. One of the things which doesn't seem to be learnt during the process of all this development is that they needed to be faster that destroyers were getting faster, that dreadnought battleships were now at 21 knots and you were aiming at 28 knots for your battle cruisers. The cruiser which accompanies them needs to be faster. In fact, it's quite sad when you look at these things that they do need to be faster and this is really not thought about. It's, in fact, something which will be a plague the scout cruisers the entire way through. All, none of them will go faster than 25 knots. The light cruisers will get there, and this is one of the problems for the Royal Navy, I think. It's that the, these cruisers, and one of the reasons why they almost get a bad name, is because they are, for what they need to be do, slow. They are... The fast cruisers to lead destroyers in a pre-dreadnought era. When your battleship goes 18 knots, your destroyers can go 25 knots and your cruisers can go 25 knots. And they'll have the speed to do what they need to do. Once your battleships are going 21 knots, you need to be faster. By three, probably four knots than you were previously. 
if you've got a battle cruiser around that can do 28 knots, you need to be able to be fast enough. Probably not at the same level as the overhead battleships because a battle cruiser to an extent is supposed to be able to use its speed to be able to get itself out of trouble. But you need to have the speed that you can keep up with that battle cruiser and not slow it down. But still, she's a good looking ship. You know, she's got these four stacks and you, you're starting to realise that four stacks is a thing going through at this point. There is a need for air, air and there is a need for the generating flow in engines to deal with the power and the pressure. And they're still working out how to do it. And small tube boilers are starting to percolate at this period. But they haven't yet reached the, the Navy, really. Which is sad, because, well, as we've been over before, the Queen of Class could have been really pretty, uh, pretty cool. Even cooler than they are. With a little, if the British, go, uh, the Admiralty had been just a tad less conservative. And yes, they do need to be conservative, which is probably the reason why these ships are all 25 knots. Pushing more could cause a trouble. It could cause you to have to increase uh, increase the size. It could cause you to have to do all sorts of things to push them faster than twenty five knots. And you know, twenty five knots is enough for the moment. But that's really the problem, because if we consider the period from 1905 to 1914, the world of naval warfare changes almost overnight. In comparison to the pace of the 19th century, the ships that are built, well, let's be honest, HMS Dreadnought in 1905 is the world stomping battleship there is nothing anyone has in terms of battleship that could win in a two on one or possibly even a three on one fight against her because of the advantages of long range gunnery she can produce By World War One, she sinks a submarine with ramming it. She goes from being the world beatingest battleship to being Where's Dreadnought? Oh, she's down in the channel backing up the um pre-dreads securing the channel squad the channel ah so she's in the blast the germans ashore or die gloriously group yeah so let's consider what are the what are the changes for this and that's a lovely but i drawing about us here um, 3,350 long tons, which is pretty much on the money for the previous classes. Uh, a little bit heavier than them. They are mostly sub, well, they're mostly around two and a half to 3,000 tons. And this one is, uh, this class is over it, but most of that seems to have gone into giving her something in the region of some armor half an inch to an inch of deck armor although again that's not unusual with some of the classes and a conning tower of four, uh, four inches thick she has six single four inch guns for each loading ones quite rapid firing four single quick firing three pounders and two single 21 inch torpedo tubes now i should point out that during the um the torpedo tubes were submerged by the way during the war, World War One, four additional four-inch guns were added, 
amidships to increase their firepower, and some 3 inch 20 hundredweight anti aircraft guns were added. Although by 1918, that was re those were replaced. Uh, that was replaced by another four-inch gun. There is a debate as to whether or not they got one or two. Most sources seem to claim they just got one, but some others suggest they had multiple fitted. It depends on where they seem to be fitting them, and it could be that one ship got one and one ship got two. Um, their protective deck was curved. But being 25 mm thick on the slope and 0.5 inches, that's 13 mm thick on the flat. So I'm not sure about whether I think a conning tower with 4 inches is actually worth it, but we'll leave that to one side. Power came from 12 Yarra boilers, supplying two Parsons steam turbine sets with 18,000 shaft horsepower to drive four shafts for a top speed of 25 knots. 12 Yarrow boilers. Length 123.4 meters overall. Beam 12.6 meters. Draft 4.3 meters. Their boilers burnt both fuel, oil, and coal. They carried 780 long tons of coal and 189 long tons of fuel oil. This gave them a range of 4,260 nautical miles at 10 knots. And they had a crew of 317 officers and, uh, officers and sailors. You start to think, A, what could be achieved by them being entirely oil-fired? B, what could be achieved if they've managed to go for higher pressure boilers? It's, it's not a wrong thing to say that a navy is inherently conservative because they're spending your money to defend you, and if they get it wrong, you die. So that's one of the reasons why they tend to be conservative. But that's also one of the reasons why classes like the scout class, are, the cruisers, are massively missed opportunities. Because they're not being built in that massive a numbers that if you had mucked around with them and something had gone horrendously wrong, you probably wouldn't have had it held against you that much. And again, with four builders, if they insisted they'd all be turbine powered and oil powered in the earlier generation, it would have been people could have gone, ooh, what about if we run out of oil? Well, Okay, make them joint dual fuel so they can have coal or oil. And you can't really complain about it. And you could have tested them out, and then these ones could have been all oil. And you could have built from there. It would have made sense to do that. But it's a missed opportunity. Three thousand three hundred and fifty long tons. That's three thousand four hundred metric tons. Think about that. That is about well, let's put this one. The Batch 2 River class patrol vessels that are currently in service are 2,000 tons. So these weighed, well, roughly, you could get away with saying you could, you could have three of batch, but for the, the two of these ships weighed as much as three Batch 2 River class. So that's HMS's Ford, Medway, and Trent. It's an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? The way ships change. Today, 
patrol vessel weighs almost as much as a cruiser did. This is Pembroke Dockyard, and it's an interesting thing for them to have picked this period because they're a fairly reliable dockyard. Look at that. All that, no ships built since 1816. And trust me, this is not all the ships built, but more importantly, let's look at this list from 1882 onwards. Battleships or royal yachts are underlined. Cruisers are bold. Scout cruisers are bold, underlined, and, well, I clicked that little essie. They built some marines. They built a, a sort of torpedo cruiser, really, HMS Hazard. She's a bit of an interesting specialist. But... When you start looking at those ships, they're all fairly big, prestigious, important ships. This is not just any yard. This is a very capable yard. This is a yard which will churn out three of the C-class light cruisers. And which, from now on, is going to churn out every single one of the scout cruisers. So, Bodicea, Bellona. Blanche, Blonde, Active, Amphion, and Fearless all come from this yard. So the Ronde has gone and got everyone's experience, and they've basically taken it to one of the yards and turned and sold them. You're going to become the crack specialist of producing scout cruisers, and then you're going to build light cruisers. And you've been building armor cruisers. You've built some very big armoured cruisers. Duke of Edinburgh, Warrior, Defence. You've also built Cornwall, Essex. This is a yard which cannot be overstated how important and how valuable it was to Britain. It's also a yard which, let's be honest, doesn't have that good an experience post-World War One. The last Pembroke-built ship afloat was the uh, Hulk of HMS Inconstant, which was broken off the barge in 1956. It was actually announced in 1925 that Pembroke Dock and Recife were both redundant and would be closed. It's interesting to see how many ships are currently built in Recife to this day. Um, Stanley Baldwin received a petition Stressing a lack of alternative employment and economic consequences of closure, but he refused to overturn the decision. Admiral Beatty declared, whether these yards are necessary for naval purposes, the Admiralty is only the only competent judge. As to whether they are necessary for political or social reasons, is for the government to decide. The fact is that so far as the upkeep of fleet is concerned, they are entirely redundant. Well, considering I start off with most opinions on what does BT think, the odds are the opposite is the correct way, I'm going to go through and think about this. This was a very experienced, very useful yard. However, the problem for this is that the Royal Navy of the interwar years, especially post the 1920 Washington Treaty, is not the Royal Navy of the pre-World War One era. It doesn't have the production of ships going on. It doesn't have the constant throughput of ships. It doesn't have the ability to adapt and the, 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 the ability to control its own size. Everything is sort of to an limited. Now, admittedly, it can build as many cruisers as it wants. So, honestly, they could have turned around and gone, well, what we'll do in Rossife and what we'll do in... Pembroke is we'll just keep churning out cruisers. They could have churned out E class, F class, G class of the light cruisers, just kept producing six inch gun cruisers and kept improving on iterating on the design. 
and just had these yards constantly building cruisers. There is no tonnage limitation in the Washington Treaty. They are limited to 10,000 tons per ship. They are not limited in how many numbers of ships they build. So you could have kept building cruisers. And they don't. Now we can say that's, uh, that's because they don't need to. They've got the C-Class in service. They can afford to take some time to sit back and evaluate wartime lessons and then start constructing. But honestly, if you're going to have a capital shipbuilding holiday, develop a building, turning two of your yards, or at least one of your yards, into the equivalent of a cruiser factory, a light cruiser factory. That's just constantly churning out a cruiser a year. A light cruiser a year. And just keeping it going. Doesn't seem to me a very stupid idea. It seems to me a very sensible idea to keep the economy in the area going, keep people employed, and, and to keep you allowing to improve and refine your cruiser design. So at any point, when you need to, if you need to do a mass order of upgraded cruisers, we'll take that design, that's working, and boom, go. Done. BL 4-inch Mark 7 naval gun. This is what was fitted. And it's a rather interesting weapon system in that it has a bit of a checkered career. It's considered... A heavy four inch. I don't know why. Uh, its shell is 31 pounds or 14 kilograms. And, well, the muzzle velocity was 2,852 feet per second. It could, rate of fire was between six and eight rounds per minute. And considering that's entirely crew loaded, that depends on A, crew number of feet and number of people involved, B, the training of the people, and C, how many people are actually dead by that point, by the time you're fighting? So you know these things can change, and the maximum fire range was eleven thousand six hundred yards, or ten point six kilometers, and an angle of fifteen degrees. It's a weapon most uh, most commonly remembered for being used as uh, coast artillery and. Equipment for the defensively equipped merchant ships in well, the Second World War, the lovely Dems. But at this point, it arms the Bellafron class battleships, the Vincent class battleships, Bodicea class, of course, HMS Neptune, Colossus class, Indefatigable class, Orion class, Lion class, Bristol class, Blonde class, Active class, and the King George V class ships. All will receive this lovely four inch gun as a part of their primary to the scout cruisers or secondary fit for the capital ships it's a good simple mechanism and it does what it's required to do the ships themselves of the but a seer class are fitted with two forward, two roughly midships either side, and then the aft pair are one full of a sort of an XY line out, but they aren't super firing, they're just positioned on the deck. So technically, you have a broadside of four, and you can have three guns covering rear and two guns firing forward. Now, myself, what I find interesting about this is this is also the time at which the Royal Navy is looking at... Now, this is one of those areas of history which is debatable, okay? So I'm going into something which is under debate as to whether they are or are not. But it seems to be about this period that the Royal Navy is first sort of considering turrets for small for non-capital ships and when i say this they have turrets on their larger cruisers but they're usually single gun affairs and they're starting to consider the potential of a multi-gun turret 
well, a twin gun turret for a smaller cruiser. This is the sort of start of the ideas which will develop and evolve, and eventually you'll see a twin six inch gun turret appear on HMS Enterprise. E class, cool. But it takes time for that to happen, and this is the first period when they're really considering it. And you do sit there and go, if ever there was a ship which had been perfect for having one of these sort of turret arrangements, it would have been this class, because you could have had three turret centerline, one turret forward and the XY sort of arrangement aft, and you would have still had a six guns for each broadside. Well, you would have had six guns for broadside, you still only had six four-inch guns. But it would have been a far more efficient use of firepower. There again, there is advantages to having individual mounts. People always, as people like to remind me, it makes them more survivable because you have to take out each individual mount. But as they're all exposed, I'm not sure whether that uh, is sort of that survivability is that much greater than if they were put in a, a turret with some minor protection at least. I don't know. It's a debate one. So this is the lovely Bodicea, and she is pretty. She is very pretty. She's the fourth ship to have borne her name in the Royal Navy, and she's laid down on the 1st of June 1907, launched May 1908 by Lady Kensington, and she's the first turbine cruiser in the Royal Navy. So when she's completed in June 1909 and put under command of Francis Lake, Leak, to begin her testing, which will be completed under Captain Edward Charlton, she unsurprisingly became the flotilla leader of the first destroyer flotilla. Charlton was succeeded by Captain Haggard, and he in turn was was succeeded by Captain Ernest Carey, when the ship was transferred to the third destroyer flotilla in July 1912. Carey was only command until April 1913, when Cecil Fox replaced him. At this point, Bodicea was transferred to the 2nd Battle Squadron, and Fox was relieved by Captain Lewis Wolcombe. In July 1914, she took the then Vice Admiral John Jellicoe from Wick to Scapa Flow to assume the command of the Grand Fleet. So for a while, Bodicea could be considered the flagship of the Grand Fleet. Basically, the time it took her to transfer Jellicoe from Wick to Scarpa Flow before he actually assumed command of the Grand Fleet. She's assigned to the Second Battle Squadron in Scarpa Flow at the start of the war. However, during the German bombardment of um, Scarborough and Hartlepool and Whitby, she goes to sea in the severe weather where she loses her bridge and several crewmen overboard in the Pentland Firth. She therefore has to return to port for repairs. She takes part in the Battle of Jutland, assigned to a position at the rear of the squadron and did not fire her guns. She actually spotted the German fleet the night after the battle, but her report wasn't passed to Jellicoe for fear of giving away the position of the Grand Fleet. Oh, happy days. Anyway, Wolcombe was then relieved by Captain Algernon Candy on the 8th of September. I'm not sure if that was quite as fast as Jellicoe would have liked. The ship was relieved in the squadron by her sister ship Bellona in October 1917 and then carried out the tax duties. During this period, she begins her conversion into a mine layer. In, uh, she's then assigned to the 4th Battle Squadron in January 1918 and lays mine at the entrance of, to the Cattle Gap on nights the 18th, 19th and 24th, 25th of February 1918. Laying somewhere in the region of 140 of her 184 mines in three missions. 
Although there is a debate that they could have actually deployed the full 184 there. It's one of those interesting things that no one's quite sure quite how many mines they deployed. Which always worries me when there's differing figures. I realise I haven't gone and looked at the primary material myself, but three different historians I've read on the subject have all given different figures. And so that is an archive document I want to go and see at some point. She remained with the 4th Battle Squadron for the rest of the war. Which is signed to Nor in February 1919, placed in reserve the following month, and then paid off in February 1920 at Chan Dockyard. She's used for harbour service at Dartmouth until she scrapped in 1926 to be broken up at Aloha and Rossai. She'd served well. Bellona, her sister. Was the sixth ship to carry that name. Orders part of the 1907 naval program. Laid down at number five slipway at Pembroke Royal Dockyard in June 1908. She's laid uh, she's laid down by Mrs. Kingsford, wife of the captain superintendent of Dockyard, who was at that time Rear Admiral Henry Kingsford. Henry Kingsford, of course, goes on to become a full admiral in the Royal Navy. And... Uh, has quite an interesting career. Had served as head of the Victorian Naval Forces at one point. She's launched in 1909 by Lady Lenora, wife of John Phillips, Baron St. David's. Completed in February 1910 under command of Captain Edwin Alexander Sinclair. Also has an interesting career. Who was also and commander of the Second Straw Fleet at the time. Then he was relieved by Captain the Honourable Herbert Brand, always nice when you have an honourable, and then her most famous captain turns up, Captain Reginald Turret. He replaced Brand on the 10th of August 1912. At that point, the ship was transferred to the 1st Battle Squadron in June 1913, and Captain Roy Percy Royds assumed command on the 5th of July as Turret was needed elsewhere. She was still assigned to 1st Battle Squadron, at the start of World War One, and in December 1914, she collided with the destroyer leader, Broke. Although both ships were seriously damaged, thankfully no lives were lost. At this point, Captain Arthur Dutton relieves Roids in April 1916, and Bellona was able to take part in the Battle of Jutland. She was assigned a position at the rear of her squadron, and so, like her sister, did not fire her guns. It's amazing how many ships during the Battle of Jutland do not actually fire their guns, because they're not in a position to do so. Dutton was relieved in his turn by Captain Cloud Sinclair, and who himself was replaced by Captain Ernest Denison. She was, like her sister, converted to a mine layer, and then briefly assigned a 4th Battle Squadron before actually rejoining 1st Battle Squadron. However, she's then transferred to Second Battle Squadron. So she's really moving around squadrons. She joined her sister in laying mines at the entrance of Kattegat on the nights of the 18th, 19th, and 24th, and 25th of February. And she lays somewhere in the region of 280 up to possibly 306 mines during four missions. Uh, Captain Theodore Big relieved Denison in November 1918, and after war, she's her, her assignment to the 2nd Battle Squadron is ended. She goes to Devonport Dockyard, placed in reserve there the following month. By December, she's listed for sale, and by 1921, she's been bought for scrap by Foss W. Ward at Lalant. <laughs> They were good ships. They were little ships, but they were good ships. But they were crippled by a very conservative Admiralty's approach to procurement. Because despite these being the first turbine powered ships, well, turbine cruisers, the Royal Navy had, that's kind of a bit, uh, it's kind of late when you consider that Dreadnought has been around for a while. They're ordering all these turbine powered battle cruisers, battleships, and finally, a cruiser is turbine powered, and even then, we're not going for a fast turbine, we're going for 25 knots. 
They're good ships. They work hard. But there's only two of them, and they're not built as they could be. So what we've got coming up. Well, next week we have SMS Admiral Spawn and the Navara class. And then following that, we have all the equitable treaty stuff coming on. And then we have the Pensacola class. And then we have more equitable treaty stuff. And then we have introduction to US cruiser strategy. And then we have Gussiano class of the Rage of Marina. And then we have equitable treaty stuff. And then we have the Sufren class on 21st of June. So we've got a very nice lots of videos coming up, period. I hope you enjoy them all. And again, this is without an alternative. Thank you for your support. Really, none of this history will be possible without all that you do. So thank you. Take care and have a nice day. You'll do Juddy Tots, but you're not the same as Kinder Buno.